Good morning, everyone. Welcome to um, Living with Loss, playing the hand that you are dealt. Some of you are joining us for the first time, and some of you have been with us for the entire series. I am Mindy McCulley, and I'm sitting in the in for the other half of my production team, Dr. Amy Kostelik, who usually sits in the hosting chair. We are just over halfway through our seven part series. And um, if you have been with us the entire time, we are so glad that you've been with us. If this is your first time, if you haven't registered, we would love for you to um, register with us and I will put the link in the chat box for you to register um, so that you can get all of the follow-up materials. It is our hope in FCS Extension that these sessions will help you come through hard times with hope and vitality and a renewed sense of purpose. We have two more sessions that will take place at 11 a.m. Eastern um, Daylight Time right here um, on May 20th. Next Thursday, we have mental health, which will include suicide and substance use. And just as a reminder, that session will only be available on Zoom. So we definitely want to make sure that you get registered for that. Um, the following Thursday on May 27th, we'll have self-care and outdoor physical activity, and that will be our final session. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to review just a few housekeeping rules. First, please keep your microphone on mute. That will aid in the sound quality for all of our participants. Second, if you have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. If you're watching on Zoom or in the comment section, if you're watching on Facebook Live, we will monitor those and get them to our speaker um, so that she can address those at the end. And, or if you prefer, you can also um, unmute yourself at the end and ask questions out loud. Um, sometimes one of the best ways to deal with grief and loss is to find something tangible that you can control. And today's guest might help you do exactly that with financial resiliency. So let's get started. It is with great pleasure that I introduce today's speaker, the newest member of our FCS specialist team from the UK Department of Family Sciences, Dr. Nicole Huff. Dr. Huff is a trained family therapist who serves UK as an assistant extension professor of family finance and resource management. Her work focuses on improving the financial and mental well being of individuals and families. Her specific research interests include financial resiliency, adaptation and coping, debt recovery and rest relationship restoration, family resource management, and the intersection of financial health and mental health. It is my pleasure to hand over the Zoom stage to my friend, Dr. Nicole Huff. Thank you for presenting for us on this very important topic today, Nicole. Thank you for having me, Mindy. I am so glad to be here um, with you all because it is very important. Um, I think that, um, you know, anytime that we can um, look for ways to adapt and cope when faced with challenging circumstances, the better able we are to rebound from those. And so we are um, uh, as Mindy said, we're going to be talking today about financial resiliency and how to recover from financial setbacks. And um, some of the, the things that we'll focus on over the next little bit um, include, you know, just overviewing some of the common causes of financial setbacks. Um, but then we'll really shift gears and talk about ways to build financial resiliency and then steps to financial recovery. And so whether you are someone who is experiencing a financial setback um, or you have experienced or maybe you know of a loved one who is experiencing a financial setback that you can share this information with. Um, often finances are one of those things that we, we don't talk about. Um, and especially we don't talk about if we are struggling. And so if you know of someone or if you are someone who has experienced financial setback, um, maybe you can um, use the tools and some of the things that we'll talk about over this next um, little bit together to, to help improve um, your resiliency or the resiliency of someone you care about. So, you know, we are in a very unique time in history uh, where we can relate to this idea of unexpected financial setbacks. 
And so the pandemic, um, we have just in Kentucky alone experienced unprecedented loss in terms of unemployment rates, um, in, in job losses, um, but we've also experienced things, losses um, in terms of our schedule. Maybe you have a family who has gone from a dual earn income to a single income. Um, we've seen resource scarcity, manufacturing shortages. We're in the middle of, of a height gas shortage or accessibility has been limited now, um, not in Kentucky, but in other parts of the United States. And so, you know, looking at financial and resource management loss is something that we all need to consider. Because if you are listening and you have not experienced um, an, an unexpected financial setback, the chances are good that you will at some point in time. And, um, you know, the goal of financial resiliency is to either avoid those setbacks or in the face of them, be able to bounce back a little more quickly. Now, um, you know, most loss um, occurs, um, it falls in one of the following five categories. And you see them on your screen. So disease, death, divorce, disaster, and downturn. And, you know, um, any of these can have associated financial setbacks that come with them. Um, and so, you know, in, in the event of an unexpected disease or accident, um, you may have medical bills or the cost of medication or hospital stays. Um, in, in the event of death, uh, especially unexpected death, um, but in, in any death, you may have um, funeral costs or um, any, um, you, you may have to rearrange your household if that loved one was a contributing member to, to your family finances. The same with divorce. Um, you know, most uh, people who enter um, can, relationships don't do so with the intention of divorcing. And so while divorce can be a common um, relationship experience, it can be very disruptive to a family's finances. And so navigating your financial situation after a divorce, you may experience financial setback. Um, disaster is one, and we've seen that in Kentucky this year um, with, with flooding, for example, you know, maybe tornadoes or hurricanes or ice storms and snow, snowstorms, um, but also, you know, health disasters, and, and we're experiencing that. And then just economic downturn. And, um, and you know, I you experienced this personally with the 2009 recession. And so that is something that you know, economic downturn can happen um, during recessionary times um, or like this year, it's residual based on um, economic times that have changed um, because of the pandemic. And what's unique about the pandemic is it has overlapped many of these categories. And so some families may have experienced all five of these unexpected financial uh, or unexpected um, lost categories as a result of the pandemic. And so you're feeling the crunch from multiple areas in terms of your finances. Um, but I know that um, from experience, when the financial recession of, of um, you know, about a decade ago, um, or a little more now. Um, but my husband, um, he experienced a job loss that was unexpected um, as a result of the recession. And that had to, we had to restructure our family. We had to restructure um, our trajectories. Um, we had to get back on our feet. And at the time I was pregnant with my second child and I had a small toddler. And, um, and so we, um, you know, I do speak from a place of, of knowing what it is like to experience an unexpected financial setback that can have ramifications, that can make you feel hopeless, and, um, and what it's like to rebound after that. And, and so, you know, know that um, no one is immune from loss of any kind, but also not financial loss. Um, and we'll talk about, um, you know, what we can control and our locus of control, but then also what happens when things are out of our control and still how can we navigate those times. And so financial loss is, um, it is a loss. And so when our finances take, um, take a hard turn, we can grieve for those. 
And so if you've experienced a job loss, um, if you have uh, lost an investment, if you have been hit financially in ways that it is hard to, to stay on your feet, know that experiencing grief can be very common. And as you've heard throughout this series, grief is not cyclical. So it, it and it's not, li- it's not linear, excuse me, it's not linear. So we, we don't move through these um, very, you know, easy um, and, and move clearly from one stage to another. But instead, you know, one day we might be very angry. The next day we might be sad. Um, We might want to, you know, um, in terms of our finances, spend as if we don't have any any financial troubles. And so we may experience some denial. Um, And so experiencing the grief cycle is common if you're experiencing a financial loss. But as with any, um, any grief that you experience, the more able and the more quickly you are able to um, to accept the situation, um, the better able you are to move on. And then um, with some of those five categories, we do see that um, with financial loss, they often coexist with other great losses. So the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, the loss of your health. And so it's not just that your finances are impacted, but usually another area of your life is impacted. And so which can you know, really exacerbate some of those feelings of grief that you may have. Um, you know, but, um, you know, as Mindy was reading some of my areas of, of interest and in, in experience, we, the word resilience, it comes up. And one of the things that, um, that, you know, kind of shifted my career into financial um, management and financial education was coming from a place of experience with this, but also working with people who, who are experiencing um, you know, extreme financial loss and not able to navigate and seeing the other, seeing their relationships suffer, um, seeing their mental health suffer, um, seeing, you know, even suicide, um, because our, our finances are so tied to our livelihood that when we are feel, feeling financially strained, we can completely lose hope because we feel and we begin to fear that we are not going to be able to provide for ourselves or our family. And we can feel very, very threatened. And that can be consuming. And, um, and you know, helping people realize that very few things in life are irreversible, including financial loss. And how can you you know, um, how can you rise up against that type of adversity? And so I love this picture and I love the quote that goes with it. So, you know, the same boiling water that softens the potato hardens the egg. And so, you know, as you experience loss of any kind, you know, I just want to challenge you. Are you going to be the potato? Or are you going to be the egg? And so we can see adversity um, as not just setbacks, but as opportunities to, um, to strengthen and grow in ways that we couldn't have foreseen without the challenges. And so, um, you know, financial resiliency, what is that? Um, and so not just bouncing back from an adversity, but particularly the ability to withstand or recover from impacts that impact um, one's income and or assets. And so events that um, impact one's income or assets. And so it's not just your finances. It could be your house. And so maybe a disaster if if you're experiencing flooding and you lose your home suddenly, that's a big um, financial and um, resource setback. And so some work out of um, the University of Minnesota a professor by the name of Sharon Danes, um, she did some work on um, resiliency and found that, you know, there are um, five categories and characteristics that can really help improve your resiliency in the face of adversity. And so the first one is to remain positive. And so this is that, you know, viewing challenges as opportunities 
Um, and this kind of, you know, the lemons to lemonade mentality. Um, but it really positive people reframe situations. And so not just looking at the negative, but actively trying to point out the positive in the situation. Um, and you may hear a positive person say something like, well, this is bad, but I realize it could have been worse. And so looking for those exceptions to the problem, looking for the times where, um, you know, they can point out the positive things in an, in an adverse situation. Um, but the second um, attribute is focused. And so people who have resiliency um, tend to be focused um, on where they are headed. And so, you know, um, a saying that I like to use a lot, and you may have heard others say is, you know, you can't change what has happened, but you can change what you do about it. You can't go backwards, but you can um, you can change what you do moving forward. And so this this idea of sticking to goals, um, sticking to a forward vision and not um, not getting caught up on, again, the things that you can't control, the things that have happened, but instead on what on, what are your actions moving forward and being focused on the future and on problem solving and solution building um, rather than the problem and the attributes of that problem. So the third characteristic is flexibility. You know, blessed are those who, you know, won't, won't be bent out of shape. I don't think that's a beatitude. Uh, but, um, you know, but blessed are the flexible is, is often um, is something that we hear. And so, you know, if we don't learn to bend, we'll break. And if, if the past year has taught us anything, it is that we just have to be ready to roll with the unexpected. We have to be flexible. And while we can be focused on our future, we can, um, we can um, allow ourselves to not be rigid, but be flexible about how we solve problems. We can be flexible with our solutions and we can be flexible with that path, with the journey that we're on to, to reach a goal. And um, resilient people often tend to be organized. And so again, you know, um, if we have a plan, but we don't have a way to make that plan happen, um, then, you know, it, it's not really a goal. Um, and so with financial setbacks, it's very important that we're organized, that we're organized about our finances, that we're organized about our um, our assets and our liabilities, about due dates and how much money we have coming in and our cash flow. Um, and we'll talk about all of that as we continue. But being organized can help with those feelings of chaos. And so rather than feeling when, when we are not organized, we feel very overwhelmed and um, and the chaos tends to manifest itself in every area of our life. But that is where organization can give us some control. And so in terms of finance or resource management, you may not have a lot, but if you keep what you have organized, you can see. And when we can see the bigger picture, we tend to um, take some control over what makes us feel overwhelmed. Um, and then finally, they are proactive. And so people who are more um, prone to be resiliency when in the face of adversity, they are proactive. And so they are, they are not waiting for a solution to, to seek them out, but they are eager um, to do what it takes to see some financial recovery, to see recovery in any kind. Um, and so they are they are um, working to change their situation actively. Um, and so this is a model called the rebound model of resilience. And it is, you know, in the face of adversity, and we see this little, this, uh, you know, little dome-shaped um, speed bump um, over to the right of the screen. But when we're faced with adversity, when we bump into it, um, you know, there are three ingredients that can really help us get back on our feet. And that is commitment. Um, you know, it is uh, um, capability and then capital. And so the what, the how, and the why. Um, and so starting at the bottom with capital, you know, if we're going to, um, if we're going to increase our capacity to rebound, you know, um, we need the means to do it. And this is what can make financial recovery very 
dif difficult because um, if your finances are challenged and you especially don't have money to um, to meet your immediate needs or to, to meet the needs of a child or a loved one or a spouse um, or um, if our capital is um, is lessened, um, that can be very, very difficult. And so we want to, first of all, with financial recovery is um, identify those means. What do you need to rebound? What do you need to get back on your feet um, and, and uh, begin to actually meet your needs? The second is um, the capability. So you need to know how you're going to do it. So here's what I need. Now, how am I going to do that? You need to know which way um, you have to go to get back on your feet. And I'm going to help identify some resources that can help with that. And then the third is you need the mentality to rebound. And so um, you need to want to get back on your feet. Um, you need to be committed to get back on your feet and, um, and you need to know why. Why are you doing it? What is your purpose? Is it to care for your family? Is it to invest in your future? Is it to um, change your financial situation? But why are you doing what, what you're doing and then keeping your finances? And so, um, you know, next week, I know that Alex is, um, Dr. Ellswick is talking about um, mental stress and loss. And, um, and then we've touched on that throughout this series and it's so important. And so, um, you know, keeping um, that commitment, that focus, that why is, um, is vital in terms of financial stress. Again, because it's so tied to our, our vitality and our ability um, to meet our needs, to provide for our families, um, to function in society. We have to have money, we have to have income, um, and our livelihood depends on it. And so when our, our mental capacity is consumed with how we are going to meet those needs financially, um, it can take a lot of energy and effort away from um, other areas of our life, and it can be consuming mentally. Um, but we can... Um, we can do things and position ourselves in ways that we can be more resilient. Now, there are some things that can hinder our, our resilience um, and that can, um, that can kind of keep us stuck from moving forward. And so the first one is personalization. And so that's the, this, this idea that um, the problem is me. I'm a problem. And, and, and you internalize what happens to you and you begin to think that you are the reason. Now, in the case of the pandemic, many people are experiencing financial loss that was outside of their control. And so, you know, it, it is um, when we don't take loss personally and we realize that Maybe there's some things I could control. Maybe there's some things I can't. But you find out what that locus of control is, and then you look for ways you can learn from it. And so if you're experiencing financial setback and you've made some, um, you know, some financial decisions that you wish were a little different, then, um, then it is owning that. And so um, realizing what was in your control. And so say in the pandemic, if that, if that if negatively affected your finances, because you didn't have an emergency fund and you didn't have any money set back. And so you realized, um, hey, you know, I can do that differently. You get through this, um, this immediate time and then you move forward and you, you do things that were out of your control. Um, maybe you lost a job that had nothing to do with a pandemic. Maybe you did make some choices and it, and it was more about you. Again, learn from it. Um, don't, don't let it define you, but let it shape your decisions moving forward. So the second a resilience pitfall is, um, is pervasiveness. And so that's thinking that a bad situation applies across all areas of your life instead of only happening in one area. Um, and so, and when we feel like the problem has, in, has um, just, yeah, permeated every area of our life, that can be hard to, um, to see past. And that's especially true in financial loss because, again, it takes money to live. And so when we, um, when we realize that um, 
that not every area is impacted. There is always an exception. There is always an exception. And I, if you've heard me present on this before, you know um, that I am big on looking at at your strengths and your assets. And so, um, you know, if you'll take a deep breath with me, so breathe in. And then if you were able to just do that, then there is one strength, there is one asset. And so if the breath in your lungs is really the only positive thing that you can think of, then start there. And so realizing that every area is not impacted and that if we want to be resilient, we have to identify those exceptions. We have to identify those assets and strengths so that we can build on them. And so always look at, um, it may be, your bank account is looking a little low, but maybe you have some human capital, some skills that you can um, help to turn to turn that situation around. And we'll talk more about human capital too. The um, and the third is um, is permanence. This idea that um, that a bad situation is going to last forever, and so if. Um, if you get yourself into a habit of reframing situations, you know, this too shall pass, um, you know, maybe like a kidney stone, um, it might be painful, uh, but it will pass. And that is often the case. Um, time typically does, uh, does help situations and realizing, again, very few things are permanent in life and, um, and that if you see a situation as temporary, and you realize that with hard work, you can, you can make a different outcome. Um, it will provide you with hope that, uh, that can enhance your financial resiliency. And so some specific factors that, in, that can enhance our resiliency are our savings. And so if um, most uh, people who were not prepared for COVID-19 in terms of um, their finances, it was because they didn't have an emergency fund. And so the importance of having um, money set aside to deal with the unexpected. And, you know, the Federal Reserve recommends um, keeping a minimum of three months, if not three to six months of finances um, put back in some kind of a uh, liquid um, where you can keep it like in a savings account, a checking account, um, or some other way to keep your money um, liquid so that you can access it in an emergency. And so your retirement account um, it, it is not an emergency fund. Um, that is for your retirement. So this is a separate pot of money that is set aside. So should an unexpected medical bill come along that you can pay for it? Should your car break down? Should um, your house need a repair? Should a global pandemic hit and you lose your job unexpectedly that for at least three months to six months or more that you can pay your rent or your mortgage, that you can pay your bills, that you can put food on your table, that you can pay for your medication? And that you can beat the, um, meet the basic uh, necessities that you have. And so um, savings is one of the big factors that enhance financial resiliency. Another is to purchase adequate life insurance, um, health insurance, um, disability insurance, um, but that you, that you purchase the insurances that you need. So insurance, that you purchase the, um, the insurances that you need to help you in the event of an unexpected setback. And so, you know, it is here um, at UK, we are in the middle of re-enrollment time. And so, you know, my husband and I just sat down and we looked at, okay, what do we need in terms of life insurance? And what has anything changed in the last year that we may need more um, coverage should something happen? And then it is hard to say that, okay, I'm going to spend, you know, this amount of money for a policy that I will likely never cash in on. But the, uh, the, in the event that you do have to cash in on it, um, you want it to be there. And so, you know, meet with, um, with um, somebody that can help walk you through the insurance needs that your family has, um, especially for um, income earners in your family, that if you were to be without their income, that, um, that you, it would impact your financial situation. And the third is a low debt to income ratio. 
So again, um, many people whose finances were impacted this past year, um, the higher their debt payments, the the less um, disposable income they had. And so um, it can be very difficult to pay our bills, um, our necessities, if so much money is going out to um, to debt. And so, you know, it's recommended not to keep any more um, than 15% or less of your monthly take-home pay should go towards, um, towards debt payments. And so you really want to stay under that danger zone and to, um, to have as little debt as possible. And so the more um, that you can pay for things outright, the better. And a steady income or employability. Now, we may can't always help um, our steady income. Sometimes job loss happens that is out of our control. In the last year or the economic recession of 2009, those are examples of that. Um, but we can always um, enhance our employability. And that can enhance um, our financial resiliency. So the much more qualified we are to get a job, the more skilled you are, um, the um, and we have we have a, a curriculum on employability and how to um, become a better employer and uh, uh, employee. And so, if you're interested in this, reach out to your county agent and see if they are um, running the positive employability curriculum anytime soon, or look for ways to enhance um, your trade. And so, you know, when my husband lost his job um, in you know, back in 2009, um, you know, that was when, when I decided to go back to school. And so that is when I went on, um, you know, for my PhD. Um, and because I knew that while that was not going to immediately change our situation, it was a good time to begin to work on my employability skills so that I could increase my employability for the future. And so it was, it was um, one of those things where I had to look for an opportunity again that I, it, it took many years, um, but it was setting that stage up for the future. And so look for ways, and it doesn't have to be an advanced degree. Maybe it is just a, a trade or maybe it is um, a skill that you can sharpen and, and market yourself, but how can you be um, more employable and that, that can enhance your financial resiliency? And then this idea, and that is part of, of human um, capital. And so what do we have that we can um, sell, use to sell ourselves to potential employers, our skills, our experiences, um, our contacts, our personal qualities, um, you know, never um, consider your education or job training finished. Um, but your health is also part of your human capital. And so are you working to, to keep yourself very healthy and very, um, very uh, active? And so are you, you know, doing screening exams? Um, are you taking care of yourself with diet and exercise and sleep and your mental health? Um, things that, again, um, allow you to be a better worker, to be more focused and, and whatnot. And then also social capital. You know, um, who is in your network that can provide emotional support for you? Friends, family members, um, significant others. Um, what, what does your network look like? Who can, if you are, um, if you are sick, can help take you to doctor's appointments? Um, who can, um, you know, if you need a place to live, can allow you to come live with them. What is your social capital? What are your, um, are your support networks? Because those are things that you cannot always put a price on, but that are invaluable to our financial resiliency. And so finding those type of networks. All right, so um, if you're experiencing a financial setback, what are some steps that you can take towards a financial recovery? Um, and the first one is to accept your financial situation. And so again, going back to that, that Kubler-Ross um, stages of grief model, when we can accept our situation, we can begin to change our situation. And so if your expenses are exceeding your outcome, then you need to, um, to clearly look at um, what is going on. And so um, accurately 
um, assessing your financial situation, looking at your assets and liabilities, um, making a list of everything you owe, um, when is it due, who is it due to, what is fixed, what is not. So you begin to collect everything and then begin to see what you can, um, what has to be paid, when it has to be paid, what are your prioritizing those, those things. And so again, medical bills, um, housing, and I'll, I'll show you some, some ways that you can find housing assistance too if you need it, but what things have to be paid and, and where are there some room for negotiations? Can you shift due dates? Can you, um, can you talk to creditors about lowering interest rates? Can you talk to student loan collectors about forbearance options? Can you talk to your mortgage lender? Um, mortgages have forbearance options. And so where do you have wiggle room and beginning to identify and then reducing what you can? What are your spending leaks? What can you cut out? How can you save on groceries? How can you, um, you know, cutting cable, looking that are not necessary. Did I lose sound again, Mindy? Can you hear me, Mindy? Now we can. Yes. You just okay. So out. sorry. I'm sorry about my audio, guys. Um, but um, you know, prioritizing those financial obligations, reducing where you can, and looking for flexibility where where you can find it. Um, and so, oftentimes. We have flexibility. We are just, we don't ask for it. And, um, and so communicating your needs um, with your creditors, with your lenders, um, especially if you're experiencing financial recovery, um, if you're working towards that right now in history, then communicating, um, there are many, many, many resources for those right now um, financially impacted. And um and so talking to creditors, um, but then also communicating with those who live in your household. And so communicating, being honest, if you're in a relationship with your partner about here is our financial snapshot and here's how we can work together to reduce bills. Talking with your children if your finances are tight and you need to cut back in areas or why you may not be able to do things that you once did. But having, having open communication, um, but one, it can keep everyone on the same page, but it can help you kind of free up your finances and begin to work together towards that goal of financial recovery. And then asking for and accepting help. And so um, many times people will go on with um, in financially dire situations because they don't want anyone to know they're struggling. And so they will use credit cards. Um, they will um, not ask for and accept help. And so um, in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about some, some resources that you may find to help if you are in need of, um, of uh, resources to help you get back on your feet. And um, the first is um, the Financial Planning Association has a COVID-19 um, pro bono financial planning um, program. Uh, Mindy, can you see this on my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay, perfect, sorry. Um, and so uh, this- yes, but We can't see your, are you, did you click on the link? I did. You cannot no, see the link. No, we can't see that. No, we can't see the link. All right. Let's see here. You probably have shared the um, screen that, there you go. Now we see it. All right. Perfect. <laughs> um, okay. So in this first one, and you, uh, you will all be provided with, um, with the PDF of today's presentation with hyperlinks to all of these resources. And um and again, taking the time to comb through what is available, and there are many resources available we just don't know about. And so um, the Financial Planning Association has a pro bono financial planning program. And so this link you can go to to find pl financial planners who are working with families during, um, during COVID-19 um, pro bono with no charge to help you with, um, with financial recovery. There is also here a navigating um, this new uh, financial reality, COVID-19, market turmoil, and financial well-being. It's a great resource. It's free, and you can download that. Um, and now let me 
share the next. Um, and then the AFCPE um, is another organization that has, and I will share this screen now. Okay. Um, and uh, so they have COVID-19 resources that are, um, that are important um, for if you are looking for specific resources, for unemployment benefits, um, for response and recovery, um, for uh, any kind of financial law, social service, um, community action at law, banking. Again, lots of links in a repository that you may find very helpful for you. And so I would encourage, um, I would encourage you, and there's a few more um, links on a following slide, but if you or a loved one is experiencing financial setback right now, again, take the time to really comb through resources and let that be part of that vision, that how, that how step towards resiliency is um, looking for organizations that can help meet your needs because they exist. You do not have to do it alone. You don't have to do it alone. Um, so, but another way that, um, that you can begin to get control of your finances, especially in, um, for anybody, I think this is, this is great for anybody, whether you're experiencing financial setback or not, um, but is mastering the Diderot effect. And so I don't know if this is something that you have heard of before, but, um, if you, um, if you have, uh, how many of you, and you can respond in the chat, have ever um, have heard of the book, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? There's a whole line, like if you give a moose a muffin, um, there's a, if you give a pig a party. Yeah. So this is an example of um, the Diderot effect. But the Diderot effect is, um, it's obtaining a new possession, how, how when, we, when we get something new, it often creates a spiral of consumption, which leads us to acquire more new things. Um, as a result, we end up buying things that our previous selves never needed to feel happy or fulfilled. And so, you know, this um, phenomenon was coined um, several hundred years ago um, from a French philosopher named Denis Diderot. Um, he lived his, you know, the, the story goes that he lived his whole life in poverty. Um, and, um, and, and in 1765, his daughter was going to be married and he did not have enough for um, her dowry. Um, now, he was an author of um, a well-received encyclopedia. So while he didn't have a lot of money. He did have a lot of notoriety. And so, um, you know, when Catherine the Great of Russia heard of Diderot's financial troubles, she offered to buy his library um, for what would be about $50,000 today. So that was a lot of money. Um, oh, and that's in U.S. dollars. Um, that's a lot of money in the 1700s, needless to say. And so Diderot all of a sudden had money to spare. Um, and right after, um, he bought himself a new robe. And so he had lived his whole life in poverty. Um, but when he got this new robe, he realized that the rest of his life didn't quite match up. So he, he couldn't just have a new robe. He needed a new X, Y, and Z. Um, but as a philosopher, um, he did a lot of reflecting on how, how that one new purchase spiraled his consumption things he, that he didn't need. And, um, and you and I may have experienced this. So like if you read this book and if we had time, I would read it to you because I love this book. Um, but, you know, when you give the mouse a cookie, then the mouse might need some milk to go with it. And then that mouse might need a straw to go with the milk. And, you know, so this story continues. And, um, you know, maybe if you buy a new car, then you need the accessories to go with it or you need to service that car. Maybe if you're going to um, an event and you buy a new dress, then you need the shoes to go with that dress and the jewelry to go with that dress. Um, maybe if you purchase a new, a new house, um, then you want 
you don't want to put old furniture in your new house. You want new furniture. And so, you know, when we are looking at um, kind of reining in our finances, it's how can we kind of take control of our consumption and, um, and, and kind of master that consumption? How can we, you know, um, reduce our habits and triggers and exposure? Um, so if you're experiencing financial strain and you don't go shopping, I mean, you know, take off your one-click purchases from online. Um, don't let yourselves go into, um, into stores where you would be tempted to buy things. Um, maybe if you put things in your cart, maybe you could start using um, grocery lists or um, uh, you can shop online and pick up your purchases. That way you see your total right away and you, you know that you're sticking within your budget or you can price compare. Um, but you, you remove yourselves from situations that um, could cause you to consume more. But you also buy items that fit your current systems at prices that fit your budget. And so, you know, um, it is, uh, if, you, if you buy something, do you have systems in place to go ahead and take care of this? Will this require more maintenance? Think about the cost associated with maintaining that thing. Um, you know, looking at what you already own that will suffice. Um, looking at what truly fits within your budget. Setting spending limits for flexible categories um, to prevent overspending. So um, an example, again, groceries is a great example. Um, uh, even birthday presents, um, spending for your kids' schools or for um, new wardrobes, those types of things. And so, you know, in my family, we have we have a, a limit on what we spend for a friend's birthday, for a family member's birthday, um, for, um, you know, for Mother's Day or, or Father's Day or Christmas presents per person. And that keeps me realistic. It also keeps my kids realistic. Um, my daughter has has a birthday gift that that she wants to to give um, a friend, and her suggestion for it that she she was discussing with me last night. It went over that budget, and and having that threshold, I can remind her this is how much we normally spend. You need to offer a suggestion that fits within that category, um, because we can when we don't self impose limits, um, we can often add more to it, more to it, more to it. Um, and then, of course, always looking for ways to reduce your consumption and better manage your resources. Um, and and it, it is more important when you're financially strained, but when we're not financially strained, keeping those practices in place can off, also help act as a buffer so that we can absorb that financial shock um, when the unexpected happens. And so it's not just practicing financial discipline when things um, aren't going well, but it's it's um, practicing financial discipline often um, so that when things, um, e even when they are going well. Okay, and so here are some additional resources and I am, um, I'm only gonna just mention these. I'm not gonna go to them because I do not want um, the technology difficulties of, of um, clicking on these links and you will have them. And, um, but the first one, makinghomeaffordable.gov. And so that is, um, if you're looking for um, finances, if you're trying to get into a home right now and you want to see what you qualify for, what some of the lending um, you qualify for, if you're having trouble making your rent, if you're interested in um, refinancing options, but there is a wealth of information um, on housing available, um, you know, that can walk you through some of these. Um, Benefits.gov is another is another good one. There is a quiz when you click on it. It will ask you questions and help you identify benefits that you may be eligible for. Um, two, 211 is the same. Um, it, it is a repository of um, health care options, uh, social security options, um, any kind of relief options in your area. And so many of these will help you search by state, search by county, um, we'll show you federal resources that are available, we'll, we'll show you centers that you can contact in your area. I would also encourage you to contact your, um, your local extension office to see what resources they can point you to in your area. 
Um, again, the health care with the Affordable Care Act and, um, and looking what you are eligible for. Um, Career One Stop can help navigate unemployment issues, employability, how to increase employability. It can help you look for, um, uh, maybe alert you to jobs that in industries that are hiring. Um, and then the last one is the um, uh, Team Kentucky. Um, it is, uh, you know, Help Me at Home's eviction relief fund. And so this is what this flyer, but this is both for um, if you are a landlord or you are a tenant and you have um, trouble right now paying uh, your rent payment, there are resources and funding available to help you. And so take advantage um, of, of those resources so that you can get back on your feet, that you can find that capital that you need. Okay, and so um, I'm gonna leave you with this and then we should have a few minutes for, for um, conversation. But you know, financial resiliency is about financial well-being. And a lot of the practices that we talked about, again, they're just good anytime not just when you're um, looking for ways to recover your finances. But what financial well-being is, is the ability to fully meet your financial obligations, um, the ability to feel secure in your financial future, and the ability to more freely make financial choices. And not just any choices, but those, those um, you know, to have the financial freedom to make choices that allows you to really enjoy your life. Um, and, and financial well-being is determined by the extent to which people feel that they have control over their finances, they can absorb a financial shock, that they are on track to meet goals, and that you're not just surviving, that you're thriving. And um, that is why financial security is really important, um, because we want financial well-being. We don't want to be hindered. We don't want to feel overwhelmed. And we want to feel secure, um, because that helps our, our mental health as well. Um, and so, again, first step, maintain hope. Um, look for ways to um, increase your resiliency. Um, be committed to financial recovery, and then begin enacting those practices that allow you um, to develop financial well-being. Okay, and that is it, Minnie. Do we have any questions? That what has come through the, ch the, the chat? I know that you have posted the links as well. We will link you to those, so don't feel like you need to get them um, all at once. So far, I am not seeing any questions. Remember, you can unmute yourself if you have questions that you want to ask directly, or you can post them in um, the chat or the comment section on Facebook Live. Um, I do appreciate all that you've had to share with us, Nicole. I know that these are important recommendations, whether someone's um, currently experiencing a financial setback or to prevent um, that in the future. Oh, we've lost your sound. To feel overwhelmed. Can you hear me? Can you now hear me? I can hear you. <laughs> oh, bless. Um, you know, I don't want anyone to feel overwhelmed um, because it can. When you see links and you begin to look and it can be overwhelming. And so um, it is to just take that deep breath and to begin getting things on paper, to, um, to take time, to sit aside time in your day, to look at resources that are available, to meet with someone who can, um, who can um, point you in the right direction, but to not feel overwhelmed and just to, again, begin to feel more hopeful. And so um, sometimes a lot of information can feel overwhelming, but, um, but it's good to know there it's out there. And so that's what I want people to understand is that resources are out there to help you get back on your feet so that you can um, implement those behaviors and lifestyle changes to help you um, better navigate in future situations. I am not seeing any questions, Nicole. I am seeing lots of thanks for great information <laughs> um, I, on both on Facebook and on the chat on Zoom. So I just want to remind everyone that at next week, we will not be on Facebook Live. We will only be on Zoom. So make sure to register if you want to join us. Um, and Nicole, thank you for all that you've had to share with us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me.
Thanks everyone for your time and we'll see you again next week.